we are able to begin. Um, microphone is on for him for me. Is it on for? No, thank you. <laughs> um, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Vicky Nash, and I'm deputy director of the Oxford Internet Institute. And it's been such a pleasure over the last two days to hear all your uh, about your wonderful research, see such great presentations, uh, lots of PowerPoint styles that I think I want to pinch for my my own next work. Um, but it's my very great pleasure now to introduce our second keynote speaker, uh, who is an incredibly distinguished academic and somebody that I have personally wanted to see come and speak at the OII now for several years. Her books uh, are, are on my reading lists, so our students are asked to read them. Uh, she is uh, an incredibly uh, prolific author. I believe you published not just one or two or three, but five books over the course of 2018. Is that oh, right? thank you. Uh, which sort of puts the rest of us to shame. Um, she is Professor of both Communication and Political Science. Uh, she is Head of Department in Comms at the University of Illinois Chicago. And I think she is really one of the sort of foremost scholars uh, in, in the digital age, thinking about our concepts of self, our concepts of identity, our relationships with others, both public, private and political. Um, and I think it's also fair to say uh, that she's probably the best dressed female academic I've ever met. <laughs> and she is also utterly deserving of the title. This is wonderful. I saw that on your list of media appearances and interviews, somebody had titled their interview Queen of the Internet. <laughs> I can think of no more, no more sort of fitting epithet or one that I desire more myself. So, uh, Zizi, thank you so much for coming and giving this keynote. We're delighted to welcome you to Oxford. Honestly, I feel like a kid in a playground. I mean, I've had so many interesting conversations and listened to so many fantastic presentations over the past couple of days. Um, it's been wonderful. Uh, as you know, most of my work focuses on the social and political consequences of the net and the many platforms that um, it supports. Uh, lately, I've become interested in structures of feeling, soft structures of feeling, and Twitter, or Afghan and civic engagement. So that's what I would like to talk about today. Uh, with my colleagues at UIC, we've been tracking sentiment expression for some time. Uh, we started back in 2011, and we looked at some of the movements associated with so-called Arab Spring, um, looking first at Egypt and the events that led to the resignation of Hosni Mubarak, then moving on to the Occupy movement, uh, then on to uh, sampling from topics that uh, became popular on uh, Twitter, trending tags. Uh, then some of my colleagues and students veered off and looked at the origins of the Tea Party, the beginnings of the neoconservative movement, MAGA, uh, some of my students are looking at DACA, uh, Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement. Uh, this has led to a number of uh, publications and presentations for all of us. Uh, and the book, Affected Publics, um, for me, starting from uh, the idea of affective news that Phil actually was very instrumental in encouraging me to move forward <laughs> with. Thank you for that. Um, and then the idea of affective publics. I don't, I don't see Andy Chadwick's anymore. Nope. But he, um, he was my editor for that book, and he was very encouraging um, uh, when I presented that idea uh, to him, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. So, um, and now, of course, I'm working on something new that's called After Democracy. And Helen, I don't mean that in a way that, you know, <laughs> after the death of democracy <laughs> or after we're done with democracy. I really, in my head, this is sort of like, like a very optimistic utopia that I'd like to map out and tell the story of. So I'm hoping it'll be like something that eventually you can look at when you go to conference and there'll be all these dreadfully pessimistic books and then this happy, <laughs> <laughs> this happy place that you can look at. Um, uh, there's not enough time to cover all of that today. And I know you guys started to talk with all these clothes on and then I get warm and <laughs> I have to adjust. Um, so yeah, there's not enough time to talk about all of this today, so I'm going to focus on the one study that 
um, started it all, the study on Egypt. Um, I like to tell that story for a number of reasons. Um, I like to tell that story because it allows me to map how far we've come in terms of the methods that we use. You know, when we started uh, <coughs> several years ago in 2011, you know, we didn't have all the wonderful tools that, you know, Axel Bruns or um, uh, Richard Rogers or you all have developed and were able to use now the Silver Lab and uh, University of Washington as well, you know, so we were just pretty much uh, try to make do as best as we could with the tools that we had available. So it's an interesting methodological story. Um, and it's interesting to tell it because we see how far along we've come. And still, I worry that we might be one step behind what we'll see happen in the next election cycle. But the main reason I like to tell this story is because it allows me to explain how we got from um, from Egypt and the Arab Spring to, to Trump and Brexit, you know, how we got from the revolution will be tweeted to the election has been stolen. <laughs> or more accurately, you know, the revolution has been interrupted and the election has been tampered with. Uh, so with that, let me start and explain that when we first started looking at this, uh, we had, uh, we were not interested in affect, we were not looking for affect. We kind of just sort of stumbled on it as the most convincing explanation for the sorts of phenomena that we were observing. Uh, with my colleagues, most of our background was in political communication and journalism. So we were interested at the time as, um, uh, and Twitter also was a much, the scope of it as a medium was much smaller. So we were interested in it as a platform. Uh, for new storytelling that en enables co-creation, co um, collaborative story writing, um, but in most cases it facilitates collaborative filtering and curation of uh, news content. These kinds of collectively produced news feeds generated by citizens committing um, independent or coordinated acts of journalism or tiny acts of participation, as you might call them, Helen. Uh, they're very central to the, very important to the dominant news economy. They present an important alternative to the dominant news economy, especially as many mainstream media have to shut down or cut back in their international bureaus due to financial constraints. And finally, in situations where access to other media is restricted, controlled, or otherwise not trusted. You know, we've seen, as you all know, Twitter, uh, bots or not, emerge as an alternative for primary channel and information sh sharing and news dissemination. Uh, when we first uh, set off, we were interested in um, Twitter's and news reporting mechanism, and so we looked, what the literature told us, and still does, is that established news values tend to uh, guide how Twitter is used, meaning that um, most media tend to use Twitter to deliver the same news across a different platform, frequently with a touch more multimediality and a more, you know, click baby headline. Uh, we also looked at how the platform is used in news breaking situations, in premediation on it, or in anticipation of events that are happening or in the process of happening. And um, here I want to pause for a moment and talk about the term permediation because it's so central to how we conceptualize our research design and then also how we interpret our findings. So we borrow this term from Richard Brusen, who developed the term to talk about the form that events take on before they turn into stories. And so, Richard Rusin started writing about this post 9 11. He's very influenced by those events. And he explains that premediation is very rich in affect. And it has to do with sort of this obsession uh, that uh, journalists and news reporters develop with covering or anticipating uh, what might come next post 9 11. And he points to many examples of premediation. One I think that's very interesting is the news scroller, which has become a permanent fixture of news storytelling. And I, 
I don't know how many of you remember what television news looked like before the news scroller. I do. Uh, and it had a different form, um, a different texture. So this is of interest to us, and of course all of this further contributes to and cultivates a culture of instantaneating news stories and in the ways in which then an event turns into a story. Uh, whether it is human intervention or you know, human inter intervention generated by bots that turn it into a story. Uh, we've talked a lot about, I mean, uh, all of you in the room know and understand how homophily drives attention on Twitter, that like-minded people tend to follow like-minded others. Um, yes, you know, filter bubbles and echo chambers exist for the most part. I mean, there's ways out of them if we want to find them. And I want to emphasize that, you know, because we hear a lot about echo chambers and filter bubbles, they're new terms. You know, they're fairly new terms, but they're not describing a new habit. They're not describing a new phenomenon. Homophily is, is a central part, it's been an integral part of how we associate with other humans, how we socialize with other humans, how we survive. It's a huge part of how we select our friends, how we form our political beliefs, beliefs in general. So it's not something that's escapable. There's nothing that we can do that's going to destroy filter bubbles. You know, we, we, <laughs> we put our filter bubbles together for a particular reason. But we also need to lead balanced lives. So we must find ways out of our filter bubbles so as to have these balanced lives. Again, you know, everything in moderation. Uh, you spend too much time um, inside your culture bubble, or too much time outside it, then you're in trouble. But I think with balance, with, with a sense of balance in terms of how we interact with our infoscape, in our information environment, I think we can get to a place that will allow us to function um, as better citizens. Well, we also looked at uh, how the platform off Twitter, social media in general, facilitates peripheral awareness of news of uh, a social nature, but also news about public affairs. And uh, I'm, I mean, it's not the only platform that does that, but it does so in a way that blends the two, you know, without drawing a distinction. And I think that's been a huge part of how certain actors and also uh, has been a strategy for bots also to uh, gain prominence and be uh, crowdsourced or elevated to prominence um, uh, through you know, Twitter mechanisms of uh, retweeting and uh, validation. Um, the platform also supports, you know, enables an ambient always on news environment Alpha Media has written uh, very extensively uh, about that, and of course my, my absent editor, Andrew Chadwick, has <laughs> written a wonderful book on hybridity and how the platform introduces hybridity into news values and news production, and has recently um, updated that to include more recent events. Uh, Twitter um, also is especially relevant as a news sharing mechanism during uprisings, facilitating electronic word of mouth news sharing. Most folks who do work on it tend to follow a traditional gatekeeping approach that tracks who says what to whom, with what effect. Uh, but they're very quick to point out that this is important because the platform lends voice and visibility to underrepresented publics and marginalized issues. And I would also like to uh, emphasize this, but also uh, put the emphasis back on the broadcasting part because it's those few who do the broadcasting, who are able to give shape and form to the story, to frame how the story is going to be told, how the event itself is going to turn into a story that then is going to circulate across news media, and media and interpersonal spheres in general. Uh, finally, a word on the relationship between homophily and uh, group identity. So early on when we started this work, there were some fascinating studies um, showing that 
Ad replies between people who agree tend to strengthen group identity, whereas ad replies between people who disagree tend to um, demarcate and uh, further strengthen uh, in and out group affiliation. And this was fascinating for us because we found in our work on Egypt, again, during the time period that led to the resignation of Obama, we found a lot of conversations that fostered or helped foster a sense of solidarity and that solidified the shared sense of identity. Whereas with our work on Occupy and some of our work on Black Lives Matter, we found the same sense of solidarity in the beginning, but progressively we tracked, as many of you know through your own work, a number of counterattacks from counter publics, different forms of hashtag hijacking that interrupted the momentum, but also disrupted the narrative of the movement, creating a stop and go motion for the movement itself. Uh, Damon Santola, more recently at Penn, has done some similar work that points to, to, uh, to the same findings regarding again, these connections between homophily and group identity. So with all this in mind, we set out to, uh, in 2011, to look at the shape news about this possible resignation uh, of Hosni Mubarak and this possible revolution in the making uh, took on as it was communicated to the rest of the world through Twitter. We were interested in news values and here we used um, John Hartley's definition of news values as the uh, things that turn events into stories. I won't go over this chart in detail. Um, I will just say that we were particularly keen on using his definition because it was very consistent with our focus on remediation and understanding the process through which something happens and then it turns into a story or stories that are told across different media and across different spheres. And then we also drew, uh, took a cue from the work of Barnhurst and Neron. We we're very interested in this idea of like texture and tonality and modality. We wanted to get an understanding of the form of news as you know the look, the shape, the feel of news as specific to sociocultural context. Um, I have a clip here that I usually play that sort of scrolls through all of the front pages of the New York Times since 1856. I'm not going to play because I'm worried for time. <laughs> if, I, if, if I have time later, I'll show you. Um, but it reflects that change in texture and tonality that I s spoke about, those you know, subtle um, <coughs> traces of evolution in the different forms of um, storytelling that I'm interested in. Uh, we had some very basic general questions that had to do with news values prevalent and form. And then, eh, you know, uh, we worked with what, the, what was available at the time. Uh, you know, we played with, uh, we learned R and we played with it to do the frequency analysis and map information flows. And at some point we got frustrated with it and tried different things. Um, these variety of different, um, some SQL coding, a variety of different forms of semantic analysis um, and computerized content analysis to look at uh, relationships between adversivity markers, other patterns that were available that, that, were, uh, that we could find in the data or that we could look, at the, uh, look for in the data. Uh, we ended up working with the entire population of tweets that was broadcast between um, uh, January 24th to February 26th. Uh, it was 1.5 million uh, multilingual tweets. Uh, and then we also drew a sample of about 300,000 tweets that we did a qualitative or discourse analysis. That's an analysis that looks for particular themes in the data. Uh, for the discourse analysis, we um, we highlighted the tweets within the stream. I prefer to do that because I didn't want to lose sense for the flow of the stream. I'm not going to say anything more about the methods here because you all know what I'm talking about, and you know we we do way more advanced things now. I'll show you some graphs in the beginning that are a little bit archaic, but you know that's that's nice. We can have a laugh about them, and we can also think about if we ever put together a museum of Twitter research, we could <laughs> what we would put in it. Um, <coughs> let me talk about what we found. We did find some, you know, traces of all these values. I think those will persist, you know, until we 
sort of, you know, come together and think about a different way to tell the news, uh, or until they stop being relevant, or until the people, you know, who are interested in them or think them important die. Uh, but I, what I want to spend more time talking about are these sort of developing uh, newer news values or remediations, uh, reshapings of older news values. And the first one I want to talk about is this idea of instantaneity, because I, it defined how the story was told uh, for this particular stream, but I think it also <coughs> drives how a lot of different events are being reported and turned into stories still. So we um, understand instantaneity as the drama of events being reported, uh, being recorded, um, and then being told live through a process that instantly turns events into stories. This is not something new, but it's something that's augmented, amplified through the platform of Twitter. Uh, this was evident in the tonality of the storytelling for qualitative analysis, in the words that were used and reappeared throughout the screen, was a live version happening now, uh, but also in the rhythm and the pace of the stream. And you know, here comes <laughs> one of the first graphs we put together, and then I'll show you something more literate. Uh, but you can see here we started around 20, January 24, depending which time zone you're looking at this from. There's also a fly that's <laughs> flying around this graph, <laughs> checking it out. <laughs> and then we wrap things up on uh, uh, the 26th of February. Uh, and this is showing you uh, tweets that were broadcast in intervals of five minutes. Um, so there's like a little bleep of activity here. And what's happening here is just people on the ground. They're talking to each other. It's fascinating for me to read, you know. I mean, I read the 300,000 tweets and then I also read a whole lot more. It was like reading this, you know, polyvocal novel, uh, except it was real. It was written in real time. Uh, so people, uh, you know, here at the very beginning, they're just on the ground, they're trying to figure out what are the best strategies for protesting, and they also realize that, you know, the police uh, is eavesdropping on the stream, and it's trying to track what they do, so they uh, play around with the police a little bit, they post on the stream that they're going to uh, protest in one place, and they make plans offline to meet elsewhere, then they fool the police, they come back online and they celebrate about that. You know, uh, Diraj Murphy also tells this story in his book on Twitter. Uh, and also some of the events uh, surrounding those days. And then the flat line is when the internet was famously turned off. Um, there's some leaps of activity there uh, because as we, as folks learned rather, uh, it's impossible to turn the internet completely off. And then when it's turned back on, this has become a completely different event, you know, generating different kinds of attention from within, also beyond Egypt. Uh, the whole world is watching in anticipation, in remediation of Mubarak's resignation, which comes around uh, the February 11th and generates this, you know, momentous peak at over 10,000 tweets every five minutes. We hadn't seen anything like that at the time. Nowadays, it's sort of like an everyday occurrence, but at the time, this was momentous. We had not, not only did it give a different reach to the movement in the sense that people started asking, not just what's happening in Egypt, but how are people using Twitter and social media to do what they're doing in Egypt? Can social media make or break revolutions? But it also made the medium of Twitter, you know, it was a very small media at the time, used for very specific purposes. Um, and then, of course, um, here's a close up, okay, and, then, and a better graph, uh, reflecting and supporting our findings of uh, instantaneity. So, here with the blue lines depict the total flow of tweets, the red lines. You know, yes, we were um, counting retweets at the time. Uh, sorry, the, the green lines reflect the total volume of retweets, which is very high for that stream, indicating and supporting our <coughs> findings that people were very vested in getting 
the word out quickly. Most of what they were retweeting were live reports of what was happening. So where they were taking live tweets, re, uh, live uh, tweeting of the events on the ground, and then retweeting them so that people abroad or people within Egypt could figure out to get a sense uh, for what's going on. Also, what's important is that the volume, the red lines depict the total volume of replies and conversations that people were having. That was particularly high. Uh, and this reflects that people were not just interested in getting the word out quickly, but they were also very vested in what shape, what form the story would take as it got out. And this got us thinking about our next point regarding network gatekeeping. Uh, it became evident to, to us as we were, you know, poking around, looking around the stream, that two groups dominated the stream. One of them consisted of mainstream media and had a very static presence on the stream, uh, mostly through uh, news updates that were dumped into the stream and uh, were rarely retweeted. But a second, more vocal group of actors emerged, and they consisted of people who were live tweeting, uh, reporting the events, and also collecting, correcting, curating, and filtering the events. And those folks were crowdsourced to prominence through the long tail of the Twitter sphere. And here we began to, hey, use the wrong button. And here we begin to see some of the faces of the movement, you know, folks like um, Gigi Ibrahim, who was a first-time activist at the American University of Cairo. She was live tweeting the events from the ground. People like Andrew Carvin, who was collecting, correcting, curating, filtering information. Uh, journalists like Ben CNN, who gained the trust of the crowd by embedding himself into the movement and reporting um, getting the word out in a way that, again, affirmed, uh, you know, validated his position of prominence uh, and his relationship of trust that he cultivated with the protesters. And of course, people like Wael Goni, who barely tweeted during the course of the events because he was uh, incarcerated. But when he did tweet, he was retweeted massively. And most of what he had to say was directed against the Western media taking over this story of a revolution uh, in the making and turning it into some sort of, you know, Americanized, <laughs> Westernized dream of, a, of, a, of democracy. Uh, which gets us to this idea of storytelling autonomy, preserving the autonomy of the narrative, uh, which connects us then, takes us from this idea of network gatekeeping to the possibility of network framing. This was evident first in some of the, uh, well, this was evident in a variety of ways, in the qualitative analysis, in, in some of the flow and the rhythm and the pace of the stream, um, but also through expressions of solidarity uh, that were repeated throughout the stream. I'll read you some of those. Um, it's time to come back now and join your fellow brothers and sisters, or if the dove is a symbol of peace, the Twitter bird is a symbol of freedom. Muslims and Christians work together in a new Egypt. Libya and Egypt, one hand together, revolution until victory against all dictators. Um, and so you see how this central frame of a revolution in the making is starting to appear and reappear and be reinforced and reproduced throughout the stream in a rhythmically repetitive way. Uh, and then this was also uh, evident in this mysterious tool that we uh, <laughs> discovered in the absence of other tools that we had at the time, uh, where we were able to identify the words that appeared most frequently in the stream and then map the relationships between them. So the, the darker the line, the weightier the relationship connecting those particular words. Um, there's a number of different things going on here, but what I want to draw your attention to is the central placement of the word, of the world, uh, the word revolution, and contrast that to the peripheral placement of the word protest, indicating that this movement was framed as a revolution well before it resulted in regime reversal. Finally. 
finally, there is this idea of ambience, and we understand ambience as a constancy and continuity of an always-on environment, news environment, with a pulse of its own that's organic, that's collective. You might think of this as its own event with a life cycle of its own. Uh, and this is interesting, you know, because you might think of different events taking shape, taking form, as they're being broadcast through different media. So there is one event as is being broadcast through Twitter, or as you're following it through particular accounts. There's yet another event that's being broadcast through TV and various, um, uh, and various uh, TV outlets. There's yet another event as that story is being told through print media and various print media outlets. And then, of course, there's the actual event that's happening on the ground. So there's these subtle differences in the form of storytelling that I find really fascinating. You know? And of course, these bring up the literature on media events and a seminal study by Lang and Lang. Uh, which I want to mention briefly. You know, it's a study in the 50s that focused on MacArthur Day Parade in Chicago, and what they did is they compared the experience of people who were watching the parade in the streets to the experience of people who were watching the parade from home. And they found, when they talked to people, that it was almost like people were recalling two entirely different events. People in the streets, said, reported that they experienced a very disorganized, chaotic event. They felt like they didn't get close to the general, uh, and they were very disappointed uh, about that. Whereas people watching from home reported that they watched a very organized, civilized event, you know, with uh, the benefit of close-ups, they felt like they got close to the general, and they also felt like the general was very personable and warm. <laughs> So again, it's these little subtle differences that I'm fascinated by. And back to this idea of, of ambience, <coughs> this was evident in the rhythm and the pace of the storytelling, which was, you know, at times like this, when we see peaks in the activity, as I'm sure you've noticed in your own research, there's very little new information going on. There's a lot of repeating of the same uh, stuff frequently with some sort of, you know, affective demarcation. So what we're seeing, and here's some close-up of that activity, is the same news being repeated over and over again, retold in a subjective manner, driven by affective reactions to what is going on, and all of this sustaining and always on presence for the movement, an online home for the movement that's affectively driven. I'm not going to tell you now the interesting thing here with the stream. I mean, I consider it a fairly pure stream. I'm not going to say that there were no bots at the time. Uh, there were, but people used bots in a different way. You know, they purchased bot accounts to appear more popular um, on Twitter. Uh, you know, celebrities bought, bought followers. But what I want to get to with this, this sense of um, uh, affective intensity is that this um, led us to concluding or describing, uh, having no choice but to describe uh, the form of news as affective. And, and now, affect. <laughs> uh, let's talk about that. <laughs> this mysterious word that sounds like effect. <laughs> it's not affective publics, it's affective publics. Um, all right, not my first choice to describe something, because the literature on affect is particularly dense uh, and confusing, but I think very useful. So drawing from literature on political, on, from philosophy, uh, political science, and <coughs> psychology, we understand affect as a form of pre-motive intensity subjectively experienced and connected to processes of pre-mediation or anticipation of events prior to their occurrence. I'll give you some examples. So when you start listening to a song and you start tapping your foot to it, um, that's an affective reaction. When you're having a conversation with someone and you're nodding your head not to indicate agreement, but rather um, to just show that you're following the conversation, that you're listening. That's an effective reaction. How is it different from cognition, 
uh, or emotion, it's very difficult to say. Uh, you know, when we talk about these things, we separate them out to describe them, and then we create the impression that they somehow occur in a sequential manner. They really occur all together in a matter of seconds or less than seconds. The easiest way to describe or understand affect is to talk about babies, because they, have, they don't have fully developed cognitive or emotional mechanisms. They cry, which is an effective reaction, for a number of reasons. Uh, they, they don't know why they cry. They try to draw attention um, to what they're experiencing, but they don't know what it is, and we certainly have no clue what it is and why they're crying, but they cry for everything and because of everything. Um, for grown-ups, uh, for grown-ups, these things kind of uh, take place together. So I'll use another uh, music example. I'll ask you to think of a song, uh, the melody of which you really like, but the, but the lyrics you absolutely hate or they just make you very uncomfortable. And uh, I used to be a DJ, so yeah, I use a, that's why I use a lot of examples from music. And I have, when, it, when a song comes on and it has a very nice beat and groove to it, I'll really get into it, you know, I'll start and like bobbing my head and tapping my foot, those are affective reactions. And then uh, the, the words come in and it's usually some house diva shouting something that doesn't really make a lot of sense and I get this weird sense of unease. I don't know what that is. I start to cognitively, emotionally process that and realize that it's discomfort, disagreement, some kind of dislike with what I'm hearing. You know, if you ever wonder, you know, why songs like, you know, Sweet Caroline or Brown Eyed Girl, you know, when they play in a bar, everybody starts singing along even though they don't like each other. You know, that's sort of like uh, an effective beginning and then once you start wondering what am I doing, that's sort of like, you know, your emotions and cognition kicking in. But that, all that happens with a matter of seconds. Um, affect is not the same as emotion. It's about the intensity with which we feel. It's the difference between me uh, poking you versus pushing you, uh, versus uh, pushing you all the way to the ground. And better yet, this is a better example, it's the difference between a caress to the cheek versus a slap to the face. It's the same movement, it's the same gesture, but applied with different intensity. So you see how the same movement with different intensity reflects different intention, generates different results. Apply that to the, to the form of new storytelling. So we call this um, stream effective because it had a lot of intensity and this intensity was present in the rhythm and the pace of storytelling that was instant, it was emotive, it was filled of all, uh, it was filled with all these phatic gestures of agreement. Uh, it was also evident in rep the repetition, the retweeting that set the pace, uh, this, obs this obsession with this spontaneity, uh, and fueled the, the intensity. You know, the rep affect works in refrains, as does music. So there's this constant repetition of the refrain or the theme of a revolution. It, it was almost like uh, the refrain of a song or the chorus in a Greek tragedy, which takes, you know, one key phrase, uh, or word and repeats it over and over for intensity and to also set the tone, set the mood, set the atmosphere, you know, it's key in setting a particular atmosphere, mood, uh, for a particular event. And this was also evident in the ways in which um, oral and print cultures of storytelling, you know, the, the conventions of interpersonal conversation blended with the traditions of broadcasting in, into, in, in ways that sort of reflected a reconciliation of what, what uh, Walter Ong has termed a primary with a secondary orality into something that I have described elsewhere as a digital orality. You know, in other words, 
news, fact, drama, opinion, emotion, all blended into one to the point where we couldn't discern one from the other, and doing so made no sense. Kind of sort of lost the point. What does all this mean? Why is it important? How is it relevant to your work? Um, let's talk about effective news streams first. These kinds of collaborative news feeds expose temporal but also other incompatibilities between live tweeting the news and news reporting. I used to say that this means that you know these uh, incompatibilities are not necessarily insurmountable, but they require that we acknowledge the presence of many different types of journalism and that we train for them, that we develop the literacies necessary to process them with. And I'll still make that point, but I will also say that they present different layers of journalism. So, and they require that we train journalists to process these as layers properly and to make decisions, informed decisions about them, but that we also learn as consumers of media what needs our attention and what doesn't deserve it. So for example, you know, a tweet by President Trump, that comes in as a sort of proto-layer of journalism where an editorial decision needs to be made about whether that, in the words of the New York Times, is news that's fit to print. A pivotal, uh, not a pivotal times in the pre-election, during the entire course of pre-election campaigning, no such decisions were made. Every single thing that President Trump has tweeted pre and after his election has been covered as newsworthy, when in fact it hasn't been. It needed to be screened in that proto-layer of journalism. And then we have paid attention to it. You know, we have devoted our ears and our eyes and think about it, your know, attention these days is the most valuable commodity and it's the most, in some ways, the most valuable weapon that we have as citizens. So we must learn to not devote our attention to things that do not deserve that attention. That doesn't mean that we stay silent. On the contrary, when we don't spend time devoting our attentions to, to things that do not merit our attention, we have more time to develop a voice of resistance. And we also make room and we make space for that voice to be better heard because we're speaking in an information environment that's not flooded with that sort of, with misinformation and disinformation and also information on things that do not deserve media attention and coverage. Um, there's been a lot written about whether these are leaderless publics, you know, they, the platform, you know, sort of enables leaderless uh, revolutions. We saw no evidence of that or in other movements, in our other work, that the platform robs uh, movements of their leaders. There is leaders, there's instigators, there's organizers, um, there's people who are crowdsourced to prominence through means that are legitimate or not, uh, as we have seen in a number of different streams. Uh, there's folks who are crowdsourced to prominence, prominence through, through, uh, through sociocultural and political contexts. You know, that's the story behind many of the Arab Spring revolutions that we never got to hear because we focus so much on how social media were used. And of course, there's leaders who are crowdsourced to prominence uh, and were crowdsourced to prominence in recent elections and referenda through machinic uh, uh, mechanisms, through AI. Now, a word on affect and news storytelling and affect and mobilization. Affect is not an event. It is a reaction to an event. It's a way for citizens to feel their way into a story, okay? Just kind of like in the example that I gave with the music, you're feeling your way um, into the song. You're starting to think about what you make of the whole situation. You're feeling your way into the story. You're beginning to make sense of it. Things become problematic when affect is repeated as the event and is reported as the event. And so then we get 
headlines that are very affectively infused with content, you know, we and then are repeated, thus refueling that intensity. So we get a lot of, you know, we hear a lot about Hillary's emails, but we never get to hear about exactly what was in those emails or why that was important to our process of decision making. So there is a flatness that generates both for the process of news storytelling, but then also for the process of our own decision making as citizens. Next, you know, affect is central in generating feelings of community. And these feelings of community can reflexively push a movement forward as they did for some time with <laughs> Egypt, as they did for some time with Occupy before that movement received a number of counterattacks, as they also did for some time with the Black Lives Matter before that movement was unfairly attacked and sort of um, in terms of its narrative and its purpose uh, and its impact by a number of uh, uh, um, counter hashtags that misrepresented its uh, purpose and its uh, central narrative and the symbolic statement that it was trying to make. So, um, yes, you know, AFET can support, can drive, can reflexively push a movement forward, or it can entrap publics in a state of engaged passivity. And this is what's happening with MAGA. We hear, we see a lot of noise, but very little movement in any direction. How am I doing for time, Vicky? Five minutes. Oh, all right. So I'm gonna some really meaningful ideas um, that are worth retaining. I think are useful for our future research. Involve network gatekeeping and network framing, but I'm gonna skip over those in favor of talking more about affective publics. And so I understand and define affective publics as network publics that are brought together, identified or disconnected through expressions of sentiment. They materialize uniquely and they leave distinct digital footprints. I know this may sound like sort of like a very common sense point, but I'm emphasizing it because all too often we're swayed by the social media presence one, uh, one movement has generated, by the impact another movement has generated, and we assume that all movements are going to produce the same impact, and that's simply not the case. Egypt, and uh, especially at the time that we looked at it, had a very particular footprint that was, um, that was manifested through its own rhythm and pace, in the flow of the stream. It was manifested in its own power structure that we saw in the uh, uh, folks, the number of folks that were crowdsourced to prom prominence and the mechanisms through which they were crowdsourced to prominence. Occupy had a very different footprint. It was a very different movement. It was a movement that used the word Occupy as an open, uh, as an open signifier in Gramscian terms. Okay, as a, as a sort of signal to people to stand up and be counted. So it had a more hierarchically distributed power structure. Um, and then of course, when it started being attacked by counter publics, it had a more disrupted narrative. Every movement is unique and it generates a very different digital footprint. And as the movement evolves, that footprint, that digital imprint evolves along with it. Um, these publics support connective, but not necessarily collective action, as Lance Bennett and Alex Hagerberg have explained. And this is why I would like to add the narratives that they produce are frequently fragmented. With Egypt, and during the time that we studied that stream, we were able to trace a narrative that was, had a nice flow and a good sense of consistency and a central message. And that was because there were some curators who were working, working very hard to correct information uh, that was wrong, to curate the stream, um, to preserve the autonomy of the narrative. 
That was not the case for Occupy for a number of reasons. First of all, because it was not, again, the purpose of the movement to present an ideological agenda, but rather to present an opportunity uh, for people to stand up and be counted, as was the case for Black Lives Matter. It presented an opportunity for people to make a very strong symbolic statement, as was the case for the Me Too movement. You know, it was a very simple statement that had very rich symbolic meaning and provided, again, an opportunity for people to stand up and be counted. So these movements do not produce narratives that are consistent unless there are some curators um, that are monitoring the stream, or that is their part of their specific purpose. You know, for the Me Too movement, I was fairly convinced that there was enough, uh, an intensity associated that with that that sort of guarded it against counterattacks. And then I listened to a very interesting paper uh, yesterday that talked about the far right's attempt to hashtag hijack the Me Too movement, and I was reminded of um, Ann Coulter's uh, tweet and uh, the um, uh, 100 DB, there you are, yes, there's my friend. Who, and then my whole argument, well, I, I mean, I still feel that there was a sense of intensity that protected the Me Too movement, but it's never possible to completely insulate these uh, narratives from counterattacks. Um, they're powered by effective statements of opinion, fact, or a blend of both, which in turn produce ambient, always on fees that further connect and pluralize expressions in regimes democratic and non. They typically produce disruptions or interruptions of dominant political narratives by presencing underrepresented viewpoints. And they're sustained by streams that are convened around effective commonalities. This is the most important part. Their impact is of a symbolic nature. The agency that's claimed is claimed semantically, discursively, through renegotiating key terms, through renegotiating what certain things mean, through making statements that allow us to pay attention to particular problems that have to do with social injustice, Black Lives Matter, Me Too are such examples, Occupy as well. And the power, the access to power that they afford is of a liminal nature, so those of a transient, evanescent nature. This is important to keep in mind because the impact that these publics generate is typically not instant, not legislative, not political, not cultural, not social. It's of a symbolic nature. And I emphasize this because all too often we're swayed by the speed, by the virality with which information moves online. And we assume, or we expect, that change is going to follow in an equally speedy manner. And when it doesn't, we're disappointed in ourselves, our efforts, our media, our institutions. Um, and perhaps some of those things are at fault. But in fact, it's our own expectations that have misled us. Because change is gradual, and revolutions in the words of Raymond Williams, are long. And I would add, they have to be long in order to attain meaning. So to say that something has symbolic impact is no small thing. In order to change our institutions, we have to reimagine them first. So I will leave you, um, I will read something from the book, um, because I want to get the wording right. So what I think, in the end, is that the practices of these publics present a departure from the rationally based deliberative protocols of public spheres. And you will always see me grimace when I hear that word, because I think it's such a mistranslation of what Habermas said. Habermas said, Öffentlichkeit. And that is not translated in English as public sphere. It means openness openness to a number of different ideas um, and help us reimagine how we may define and understand civic discourse among network crowds in a digital area, era. 
So while emotion has never been absent from the construction of political expression, romanticized idealization of past civic errors magnify the significance of rational discourse, and they skim over the affective infrastructure of civic engagement. So my effort here involves synthesizing research findings to present a theoretical model for understanding affective publics as they emerge, as public formations that are frequently textually, discursively rendered into being through emotive expressions that spread virally through network crowds. So that in the end, technologies network us, but it is our stories that connect us, that help identify us, or that potentially divide us. Thank you very much. I know we started a little bit late, so I'm going to suggest we just try and squeeze in maybe two questions before we go to the next lot of sessions. So um, I'm going to take uh, two, but maybe let's just take three questions, one after the other, and then Zizi, you can choose to reply to all of them or none of them as you wish. Okay? So who'd like to ask a question? Uh, yeah, Taha, and then Dominic here, and one more. One more. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Taha. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Among many interesting points that you raised, I really enjoyed the one about Moffley and Futterbottle and the existence of uh, sequels in the creaminess. But I felt like you were suggesting that there is a universal optimal ratio between outgoing connections and in-group connections oh. for everyone. But I would think, and what I saw a lot about the internet-based platforms, that you can really change this parameter depending on what you want to have and how much empathy or how much uh, diversity you mm have -hmm. in the network. Uh, but I'm called Black Netflix. Theory that such a okay. okay, I'll very quickly respond. Okay, go. Not forget the questions if that's okay. Fair enough. There is an optimal uh, sense of balance, but it differs for everyone, is my response to your question. So, absolutely, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, from gentleman here. Hi, Eric Dean, American Public University. Uh, the traditional definition of prominence goes back to the 1960s. Uh, but uh, who said that. Uh, information more towards the front of the newspaper is more likely to get read or above the fold. Mm -hmm. You mentioned yeah. prominence several times. Mm -hmm. So what is your overall operational definition of prominence today in 2018? Oh, well, you know, sorry. Can I Okay, so operation, in terms of how we operationalize it when we were measuring actors who were perhaps to prominence, we looked at uh, folks who were um, retweeted, replied to, and referenced. Uh, the top 30 actors who were most retweeted, uh, referenced, and, um, and replied to. And then we mapped connections uh, between them and the remaining actors to understand how they were uh, elevated to prominence. Uh, prominence we understood as a, as a position from which they were able to uh, control the narrative. Uh, and this is something that we were able to affirm both through the quantitative measures and the qualitative measures. But please understand you know, that this particular uh, uh, power hierarchy was fairly unique to the stream of Egypt and the particular time that we were looking at it. And then these sort of practices um, shifted and prominence meant a very different thing and sort of was also something that people shied away from. So for the Occupy movement, they were very reluctant to elevate anybody to prominence. So we're very skeptical of who they were retreating. And then of course, it also changes. Uh, you know, prominence, I think it's, I'm glad that you identified this term. I think it's maybe time to look at that and see, me examine both mechanisms of achieving prominence and what it means in a mediated environment. Thank you for that question. And one last question over here. I'm going to think, Chef. You made an interesting point about the relationship between Twitter as a news feed and traditional news media, mm -hmm. and actually the way in which one can pollute the other. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that strikes me is that the big difference between them is verification. Mm -hmm. And one of the big dangers, of course, when particularly tabloid media repeat what is in Twitter yeah. is they don't actually verify the information where the traditional news, the central of the traditional news gathering, mm -hmm. and delivery is verification. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. 
more. You know, I think that one of the reasons why I like telling the story of Egypt is uh, if you read the stream, you see how careful people are about verifying information. And many of the conversations and the ad replies that we uh, uh, that we were studying and analyzing had to do with verifying and correcting information. But it was mostly people from the ground saying, no, you're wrong, this is actually what happened, or you're reporting this in a different way, or even flat out saying, uh, look, you know, this is you know, this is a movement that's happening, but we're not we're very skeptical about what's going to follow it, what's going to happen the next day. And this was a point that was frequently missed in the way that Western media told picked up and retold that story. Uh, so yes, you know, verification is an editorial judgment, I think, are huge and it's something that we lost when the um, the infrastructure, the financial infrastructure of uh, newspapers had to be thinned out uh, and, and reorganized. I think we lost uh, uh, some good editors and we forgot about the importance of editorial decisions. Yeah. So I think, <coughs> regretfully, we're going to leave the questions there, but you're with us, aren't you, for the rest of the afternoon. So maybe, maybe people who have other questions can corner you in one of the breaks. Um, but please, we just <laughs> been cornered by somebody. Yes, do it politely, please. Um, thank you so much for that fantastic keynote.